Hello, beautiful souls. I'm Lisa Stroda. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Holistic Life Coach Podcast. If you think you would like to share your story, contact me through the show's website, theholisticlifecoachpodcast.com, and we'll see if you're a good fit. I chat with science fiction author Mark McLaughlin in this episode. We discuss where he found his love for writing, should you self-publish or not, and where he finds his inspiration for his stories. Now, on to this week's episode. Mark is a Bram Stoker award-winning author of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Mark's work has appeared in more than 1,000 magazines, newspapers, websites, and anthologies. He is the author of many science fiction novels such as Human Doll, Ghosts of the Quad Cities, The Hell Next Door, Short Things, and Injectables, a novel of Lovecraftian horror. Hey, Mark. Thanks for joining me now, today. <laughs> now, some of those things you named were actually <laughs> either collaborations with other people or or anthologies where I'm just one of many stories in the book. And that's okay. Like Short Things was a bunch okay. of stories based on the not the movie The Thing. People know I like, people love my monster stories uh-huh. and they asked me to write for that book, which is all stories about the thing. And so I wrote a story about the thing uh-huh. and, and what happens when a, when a little component of the thing gets loose and is on board a luxury yacht. You don't go on a luxury yacht to get devoured by a, a more <laughs> oh, wow. horror. You usually go, you usually go on, on a yacht to have fun and being devoured by an amorphous creature with tentacles usually isn't considered fun by most people. But I make it fun <laughs> in the story. No. So, what got you into writing? Like, how did you how did you begin to, you know, learn that you had a talent for writing and that you enjoy it? Well, see, I had a Greek Things grandmother like- on the mother's side. Mm-hmm. Greek grandmother. Yeah. Um, not in Onassis, as many people often think. No. <laughs> but I did have a Greek grandmother who. <laughs> Was married, I think, like five times, but not to an, an Onassis, but other guys. And but not a lot of Greek but, guys out yeah, there. Yeah, not an Onassis. <laughs> not the Onassises. There was a uh, Mr. Yeah. Davaronis and a lot of others, and uh-huh. and she and I I looked a lot like her, and she never had a son in her life. She only had daughters, mm-hmm. and she would always say that mm-hmm. I was the son that God meant for her to have. That. Um, wow. uh, which is strange because I actually have an older brother, but she didn't like him. Because <laughs> <laughs> she had a thick Greek accent, and he couldn't. Uh, he, he, my other, my brother, um, didn't like, uh-huh. couldn't understand my Greek grandmother's Greek accent, and he'd always say, "Why is she talking like that?" Uh-huh. Why is she talking like that? That's how she talks. It's her <laughs> mouth. And you have to have that explained to you why a person <laughs> from another country has an accent. Evidently. But I understood her accent just fine <laughs> because I because I spent a lot of time talking uh-huh. with her. And he never spent any time talking with her. Mm-hmm. And so he didn't understand her accent. And he, she'd be talking. He'd be like looking at her like she was like reciting... <laughs> like Portuguese verse, I don't know. Yeah, just, Whatever. She was speaking Greek. <laughs> she was, sounds she was sounds like Greek to me. <laughs> but she would tell it's all Greek to me. But I understood yeah. every word she said. And she was quite the mm-hmm. raconteur. She could always tell good stories about her adventures in life and marriage and love and all that stuff. And I think mm-hmm. she taught me just listening to her taught me the basics of storytelling. I remember she used to, she even used to tell me stories out of Greek mythology. And she would say, you know, mm-hmm. that, like that Zeus, is, Zeus was God. And now in Greek mythology, mm-hmm. he was married to Hera. And I would say, so what was his relationship with the yeah. Virgin Mary? And she would say, 
That was <laughs> some lady he knew on the side. <laughs> I love, I love that. Oh well, you know he was he was married, and you know the Virgin Mary was some gal he knew on the side. <laughs> so I always loved her take on everything, you know. And she would tell me about her days when she used to attend bar in Crete. You know, she used to live in Crete, you know, and all that great stuff. And and so. Um, and she used to take me to a local bookstore in Dav- downtown Davenport called The Source, which mm-hmm. was operated by a Greek guy named D- Mr. Pekios. And and so I always had lots of books when I was little from courtesy of my grandmother and Mr. Pekios. And, um, and I just gravitated toward reading mm-hmm. short stories and, and lots mm-hmm. of horror stories. And before you know it, I figure... Hey, I know how to do this. I'll write. I'll write a lot, and so I started writing a lot of horror stories, and I've had hundreds of horror stories published, and some in, in national anthologies even. And eventually, I started mm-hmm. writing some novels, including the great spine chiller, Human Doll. For those who can't see it on the screen, I'm holding it up. It's a beautiful cover. Human Doll, <laughs> Star, a spine chilling tale of. Plastic surgery gone wrong. Don't ever get plastic surgery. Well, you don't need it. No. <laughs> so, what is that the, goes for can you describe the process of writing? Yes. <laughs> um, the process of writing. Well, you got to remember, my yeah, mother the process used of to writing work, a book. I grew up. When my mother was young, she used to work at the Rock Island. She's passed away a few years back. Um, when she was young, though, she used to work at the Rock Island Arsenal. And the last thing she did there, and I'm mm-hmm. telling a national secret here, so, was that she, her, her best friend at the office and her stole her office typewriter. And, that, and so that was always in the attic when I was little. And it was this big cast iron typewriter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Back from the days of cast iron typewriters, and that was when I learned <laughs> to type on. And I'd always wheel my paper into, and the very first story I wrote, I typed up on, on her cast iron typewriter, and folded it up and stuck it in an envelope and sent it to a um, magazine. And my mom was like, "Did you make a copy of that?" And I said, "We didn't have a copying machine." Of course not. Did you make? Did you use carbon paper to make a copy? What's carbon paper? No. But I, a few weeks later, a check for forty four dollars appeared in the the mail. So the magazine ran the story, and it's been uphill ever oh, since. Wonderful. Just one day, just sent a story off to a magazine. Yeah. And the editor, I didn't even put a letter with it. I just put the story. And the editor said, yeah, we're going to run this story in the next issue. Who are you? I've never heard of you before. Who are you? And who am I? Well, and how old were you when, you did, when that happened? <laughs> yeah. A teenager. Uh, so I was probably how about old like. You when that happened? Probably about like 17, maybe. A kid. Yeah. A little boy. Yeah. Teenager. Well, yeah, that, that I just that's decided remarkable. That's wonderful. I mean, you know, yeah. Just to take that chance, I'm gonna write it and drop it in the mail and stick it in the mail and and hope they really? and then a few weeks later a check arrived and I was like I remember it was forty four dollars. Yeah. That was my first check for forty four dollars for a story <laughs> and it was set in ancient Egypt too quite a thriller mm. and since then I've written many stories set in ancient Egypt because I love it. maybe I maybe I used to be King Tut or something back then <laughs> I like to think so so do you come up with an idea beforehand or in or Say if someone well, says, come up you know, with it does, does a publisher does, <laughs> come up with it afterward? I yeah. know the story. No, I, I got an idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
or does someone say, Hey, I want you to write about this or, and then you, then you come up with it or that do you, happens are you, is your mind always constantly going like, Oh, I've got an idea for this and write it down. And then you know, like a bunch yeah. of ideas and then publish them. Oh yeah. I, I sometimes I have like three or four stories in the works because I'm always thinking about things to uh-huh. write. And sometimes editors will say, um, editors who I've worked with will say, um, send me a story because my next book is about, and they'll tell me what the book is about. And I'll write a story based on like that, uh-huh. that book called short things was short stories mm-hmm. about the creature from the thing, the movie, the thing. And I have a story about that, about Mm -hmm. the creature from the thing gets on a luxury yacht. It escapes from Antarctica and gets on a yacht. And, oh, it racks (laughs) up some mischief then. (laughs) Yeah, that's not not, not one of the luxuries of being on the yacht that you get attacked by a thing. But, but, you know, (laughs) the thing is a movie star, so I guess that is a luxury. You're attacked by a movie (laughs) star. I really enjoyed, as a kid reading Edgar Allan Poe and you know when we studied him in grade school and that's where I was introduced to um you know horror stories and um the raven and telltale heart and those really just really scared me (laughs) I used to read Edgar Allan Poe and all that stuff of course the the authors who I Uh liked the most were the ones from the pulp era which are from the 1930s through, what would that be, like 1950s, I guess? Like H.P. Lovecraft and that his whole ilk that was in all mm-hmm. the pulp magazines back in the 30s. That's who I, I've written a lot of stories in the style of H.P. Lovecraft. He had a very verbose style that I managed to, that I'm able to um, write very well in that style. And people have always said, some people say I'm like, one of his current modern day proponents. So mm-hmm. I'm a proponent of HP Lovecraft. Yeah. So well, uh, because I like to, to, because all of his creatures were like cosmic monsters, many with tentacles. And I think that there's something, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have tentacles. What kind of monster is it? What kind of budget monster. If it doesn't have tentacles. Exactly. You know? Really? You know? <laughs> yeah. Do you think people are intimidated by writing? I mean, yes. I know. I remember having to write in school creative writing, and I, and yeah, and I was intimidated. Gee, what do I write about? Is this good enough? Um, is you know what is the structure right? And all these things, I really didn't get it. And uh, I met someone maybe ten years ago, and just corresponding with them over email and she is a writer (laughs) and so her 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 emails were you know eloquent and and i'm like oh okay yeah okay that's what you know adjectives are for and so i mean it was just it it just opened just someone's emails and the way way they wrote them just opened up my uh world on oh okay I'm, i'm starting to get this because it just didn't, writing just didn't come naturally to me. Storytelling and, you know, to tell a story, I could do that. But to put it on paper, it was harder for me. Well, because people often don't realize that you got to put exposition and description. You know, you can't just say, you know, and then the monster came in the room and ate everybody. The end. You know, you, you got to describe, you have to have plot twists <laughs> and and plot elements and descriptions and describe what people look like and what the buildings look like. And, but you, you can't just put a big lump of copy mm-hmm. saying, um, with the describes everything, just a big lump of copy there. You got to manage to work that out, work it all in, you know, it's kind of like, uh-huh. like yeah. cooking a beautiful meal where you got to integrate all the elements that you don't realize that you're being spoon fed a lot of description or anything like that. You have to, mm-hmm. you have to blend it all in together so that it's kind of seamless. And you got to have exposition. Yeah. You got to know what happened in the background. And you got to, and you and you got to describe things and 
have exposition and it's good to have a plot twist. Did I mention monsters? Good to have those too. <laughs> monsters, especially the ones with the tentacles. <laughs> if people want to know how, 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 how a novel is structured, they should read Human Doll by me. It's because uh-huh. it's, that's a good example of how a novel should be structured. It has a beginning and an ending and stuff in between. And this is one of my few novels that doesn't have like an actual monster in it. It's a, uh-huh. do you know what a giallo is? Do you know what a giallo is? Giallo. No. Mm-mm. A giallo is an, is an Italian movie that, a style of Italian movie that was made in the 70s where there would be like, like, a mysterious killer, and then you'd find out who the mysterious killer is in the end, and be like, ah! Oh. But during the whole movie, all you'd see was a person like in a black trench coat or something like that. And there were that was an uh-huh. entire genre in Italy during the seventies and eighties, and it still persists today. And somebody once said mm-hmm. that um, Human Doll was the first drag queen giallo, and it's a very good description. It's about <laughs> Somebody who has it in their mind to, uh, there's a TV show in the novel where it has a lot of, it's a talent competition for drag queens, not associated with RuPaul in any way. Mm-hmm. And, and somebody <laughs> for some mean reason is killing off all the drag queens, but it's like a giallo with drag queens. And okay. injectables is, is also about a person from the Lovecraftian universe who performs, who has her own unlicensed plastic surgery clinic that she uses injectables. She has three different kinds of strange injectables that she achieves her outlandish results with. And it's it's rare in that it's a Lovecraft story with a female protagonist. Most Lovecraft stories, Lovecraft only wrote about male characters, probably because mm-hmm. he was... Uh, a recluse. He he was raised by okay. maiden ants and never he had a, a wife for six months and he lived his whole life very lonely. He was a lonely recluse in Rhode mm-hmm. Island back in the thirties. And most of his characters were old scholarly men who who a- open ancient gateways into other dimensions and whatnot. And I'm I'm I bring all his kind of concepts into the modern day, including like, how about a Lovecraft story with a woman protagonist? Why, in his eyes, mm. that would have been like... Uh, he, he, yeah. I think he only had like maybe one story that had a female protagonist. And it was a woman who possessed a male guy's body. So it had kind of a male protagonist in that regard, that she was possessing a male guy's body. Uh-huh. So, and the other one, yeah. The Hell Next Door, is also... A terrifying tale of real estate. Oh no! <laughs> it's about a guy who <laughs> who always wonders about the strange house across the lane from him, and people actually move into it for the first time in his life, and he finds out what their story is, and it's a unique story indeed. So I like to write, bring bring things into the mix that usually aren't covered in horror, like. Real estate, uh-huh. plastic surgery, Real estate, yeah. and drag queens. Ah! Does a, a writer need to? Can they? So what's what's good? Because should they self-publish? Should they? Uh, do they like you did? You approach that publisher when you were seventeen. You just put it in the mail and. And in recent years, once I developed my own following, then I started self-publishing, and so I've got, done some self-publishing because Amazon makes that very easy. I've done both. Most most of my stuff has been published by real publishers, not by me. And th- that's more convenient because I don't have to do the like the layout and stuff like that. But I did eventually figure out how to do all that. What advice would you give someone wanting to pursue to um, pursue pursue a career similar to yours? They should first start by going on Amazon and buying all my books so they know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so they are examples of good writing yeah. and good stories, you know. Mm -hmm. But don't yeah. use any of my characters. Mm -hmm. They're all copyrighted by me. And, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and ultimately find, don't get your inspiration from TV shows and movies. Don't, don't watch a movie and say, oh, I think I'm going to do something like that because that looks real popular. Find things from your own life that you don't think have been written about and go from there. Start with your own life mm -hmm. because then that, that's a good way to assure originality because when you start with your own life, well, no one's lived your life before you, have they? <laughs> if they have, mm -hmm. then write a story about that, <laughs> about the fact that you have yeah, clones exactly. living your life. Write from your own experience, from the unique things in your life. Like I often telling Lisa that she needs to write a novel about what it's like to have a last name that's almost all consonants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, what is the correct pronunciation of your name? Stroda? It's Stroda. So the Z is silent. And, and Stroda. And, you know, it's funny. It's a short Polish name. It's, it tells me who uh, the telemarketers are when they, when they call because uh, they can never say it right. Sturzoda. Stroda, yeah. I always want to add syllables to it. I feel like I'm doing wrong if I <laughs> overlook the Z. Right. I, 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 yeah, I get Strazoda. You you know, you, there's Liza with a Z. I was thinking of you as Lisa with a Z. But uh, you know, when it's funny, the Lisa oh, Lisa. with a Z. Yeah, but, Lisa with an S. Liza yeah, Lisa with, with a Z, Z Lisa but it's in the S. last name. <laughs> so I always want to pronounce yeah. the. I want to put the Z in Sturzota. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, and there's an example of writing or her songwriters, Liza Minnelli's songwriters, who were, took something that you know, from her life and wrote that song, Liza with the Z, uh, that, you know, and it's, and when I listened to that song, I was like, these are extraordinary songwriters. It's the way they, they wrote that. And, you know, they, they came up with that. It was just cute, but it was so creative. And, um, and of course, when she performs it, I mean, it's just remarkable. Hey, we're going to come back to the show in a minute. Could you do me a favor? Could you fill out a form at the holistic life coach podcast.com and jump on the horn with me for 10 minutes? I'd like to know your likes and dislikes about the show and the biggest reason you're listening to the show. This gives me a chance to get to know my listeners. Thanks. Now let's pick up where we left off. Because that's the way life's supposed to be. You're supposed to live a, li a li an interesting life and think about mm -hmm. the interesting aspects of your life and make them interesting characters and, and, and chapters and parts of your, your, your stories. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. He said, reaching for one of his books. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find so interesting about... It's <laughs> holding up human doll right now. Um so that's what I find so intriguing about talking to people about what put them on their path to their destiny. There we go. Human doll. Yeah. Um, because it's those influences and sometimes you don't know where they're going to come from. And like you said, and the people, you know, and the interesting people you've met. And I found that when I talk to older people, my parents' generation, that there were such good storytellers that there, you know, there was, you know, I, I'm trying to get my mother to, to write a memoir. And I've told her, you know, no, you know, your generation has lived through so much. I mean, she talks about world war two. She talks about how they only had a radio. And then there was this new thing called television that was invented and how they would play records on the phonograph and they go to the dances and, and everything has changed so much. Um, and uh, so there's just, you know, so much inspiration there for characters. And then, you know, the storytelling, they, you had to be good at that. There was, like you said, 
with writing, you, you know, there's so many descriptives that you have to give to get your point across and the, uh, and the atmosphere of, you know, what's going on in that scene. And, um, I think people of that generation were, you know, knew how to do that and, um, tell stories and tell all the, the jokes that they would tell that we read more back then too. You have to, you have to be able, able to, you have to do a lot of reading in order to be a good writer. And they probably read more back then because they didn't have the internet. They didn't depend on the internet for the entertainment. Yeah. And it's funny because I, one time I did a Facebook live and uh, my parents have, you know, the old um, encyclopedia Britannica in their basement. And I, I said, this is what the internet used to be. This is what we had to do. We had to pull out the book. First, you had to either go to the library to do a research paper and use the encyclopedias there. Or if you were lucky enough to have a friend who had uh, the encyclopedia volumes or yourself, and then you had to read all that and write your paper. Now it's just uh, information is just, you know, at your fingertips and within seconds you can find out something you know, information. And then watch a cat need, video. But, um, you know, I, I really hope my mom writes a memory. You write a cat, you get right and watch a cat video. <laughs> watch a cat video or <laughs> something else. Yeah. You'll probably have to end up writing your mom's story for her. Probably. I have, um, I'm trying to interview them. And uh, my dad and I sat down for a couple hours and he all, he talked about from like age 17 until maybe age 50 about work. It was just, he just told me about all the different jobs he had and the, you know, these characters that he, he worked for. And uh, that's, I think I'm going to get it down. I'm not, I don't know if I'll get it down on paper, but I'll at least interview them. And, and it's funny because my mom has so many stories. I've always told, younger kids that if they want to learn about history to go to a nursing home and don't just read, don't just read the encyclopedia because you will find out stories. You'll find out things about the war and the depression, things that aren't in the books. And, uh, you know, so my mom's got stories about meeting Joan Crawford, about, seeing John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Senator John Fitzgerald Kennedy when she was on a trip to DC and stuff, all the, just all these little, you know, things that are, you know, fun to know. And you better write your mom's story. You better write your mom's story. You should write a novel and have one of the characters be like your mom. Cause in my book, human doll, the, the male lead, who's a male model named December storm is kind of based on me. Although no one's ever mistaken me for a male model, <laughs> uh, but the, mm -hmm. he's part Greek like me and his mother is a woman named Chloe and Chloe is based on my mom. And there's a lot of aspects. I put a lot of my mom in the character of Chloe in human doll because mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's, she had a, my mom was a crazy angry person, but unique in her own, in her own strange fashion. She was, she was um, unique because she inherited her, her father's, my grandma's mm -hmm. first husband. She inherited his very large crooked nose. And that's why the whole thing is about plastic surgery because from a very young age, I often thought about plastic surgery a lot uh -huh. because that was always a topic of conversation around the house because my mom was always talking about someday she'd get plastic surgery, but she never did. Surgery. Though she could have benefited, benefited from it because she always, she always wanted to look like Liz Taylor and people thought she looked like Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but see, that's what I'm talking about. Put, put your characters... Make the people in your life characters in your stories, and then you'll always have a, a story that's unique because no one has lived your life besides you yet. <laughs> so you ought to write a novel based on your mom's adventures 
then you can put all her anecdotes into a into a book. And dedicated to me since I gave you the idea. Yeah. So you say that the best type of writing is, is yes, <laughs> of course, of course. Um, the best stories, the best books would have an element of um, familiarity to the writer, that they should have that element in there. Tell the story that only you can tell. And if you and if you put in like like relatives and stuff like that, change their names though, you know. <laughs> change their names and definitely their addresses. Well, that, that then that because because I've talked to young writers who they talked about some movie they liked and what they want to write is a book based on that movie where they changed the plot a little bit and it's kind of like. No, that's not how you go about forging a future as a writer of fiction. You got you got to start with your own life. You don't start with a movie you liked and you just thought of a different way it could have gone. That's not being creative. That's just recycling. That's no good. And then someday that son of yours will write the book about you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that interesting that would be. Maybe you. it will be. Yeah, I know. Isn't that kind of, that's so scary. You better tell him some more interesting stuff about yourself. But <laughs> I you better give him some good stuff to work with. So he. I know. My mom has such good stories, you so know. Can... She did a lot of traveling and she saw, you know, happened to meet these movie stars and have these chance meetings and, um, you know, uh people love to hear her stories. And that's one of the things I would love to have her on this podcast. Because she could tell you just, you know, how exactly her her job as a secretary for the American Medical Association, you know, that, that let her, you know, she traveled to all these conventions and she would meet all these people and have the, <laughs> these adventures. But uh, uh, it, yeah. And then, of course, my son wrote, writes something about me. I, I don't know. It is kind of scary, though, when I think. When I'm gone, he could write a story about me. I'm not going to be here <laughs> to contest anything he says, will I? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he would. Uh, uh, I think everybody, that's why, like this podcast, everyone's life has some event or influence that to me is just so interesting and in how, how it put them on that path to their destiny. And I think some people might think, well, my, my life really isn't that interesting. And, and, and I always say, yes, it is. Everybody's life is interesting. Everybody's life is interesting. You know, it doesn't have to be like, and if it isn't, then go, like go have an adventure. <laughs> go have an adventure. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that, if you, if you don't think it is, then yeah, go out and have an adventure. And, uh, Everybody needs to look at their life and say, I need more adventure for chapter 17 that's coming up. Yeah, you know, that isn't a bad way of looking at it. If you're not, if if you think, gee, I, I haven't done much, I haven't had to, I need more adventure and then and to plan something, you know. That's a, that's a good way of, of looking at it. Maybe, you know, thinking about it. And, you know, Yeah, did you want to say something? And, and for for the book about your mom, well, throw, throw in a fling with Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> throw in that she had a big fling with Woodrow Wilson. She'll be, she'll be like, wait, I'm not that old. What? <laughs> then you can tell her, well, Ma, unless you tell me something more interesting, I'm going to put it in that oh, made-up but... fling with Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> exactly. Ma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would like you, we come to the part where we do five random questions. So, okay. Okay. All right. I'm so, ready. If you could have. I'm doing a karate <laughs> stance for the book. <laughs> You're ready. If you could have dinner with any three people, 
dead or alive, who would they be? Well, one of them would be Pete Burns, who was the singer for a group called Dead or Alive, who was a plastic surgery addict who would change his face for every album he put out. Oh, wow. Just, I want to know what that, what was his rationale for that? I mean, he had hundreds of plastic surgery procedures during his life. And um, I went, he, he died young because from, from, I think from health effects based on his, all that work he had done. And I want to find out what, what fueled him to do all that. Mm-hmm. You know, he changed his face. He, he said he liked to change his face like people change the the furniture in their <laughs> apartment it's like really <laughs> i want i'd like to find out more about that and mm-hmm. the two other people i guess mary tyler moore i wish i could yeah. talk to mary tyler moore yeah. and hp lovecraft and i want mary tyler moore to meet hp <laughs> lovecraft and <laughs> she'd be like tentacles please no thank you <laughs> mr grant this guy's talking about tentacles so um <laughs> Mr. Grant, help me. So what um the next question, what And then HP Lovecraft would really really he'd be shocked that I wrote a, a Lovecraft novel with a female protagonist. Women having adventures? Yeah. What? What? Are you sure? I'd shock <laughs> guts out of him. <laughs> so uh, what is your morning routine? Like, I drag myself mm-hmm. out of bed and have a shower and have a couple of waffles with mm-hmm. freezer waffles with honey mm. on them. They're made from real bees. <laughs> Not made from right. bees. The bees made. <laughs> right. I think it's it's important. Honey is something that has a lot of mm-hmm. nutrients. A person should have a lot of honey in their yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. And have a good breakfast in the morning and get you going. Waffles with honey. Waffles with honey. So, what is your favorite pump up song? you listen to to get moving is there any particular song um that that guy was telling you about who had the plastic surgery pete burns Uh uh-huh he had a song called you spin me round that was popular in the 80s i remember that's my favorite song you know you spin me i'll play that if i need something yeah. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby. baby right round, right. Yeah. yeah, I remember that song. That's, I remember that's that video. My, that's my wake up song. Yeah, I remember. And the funny thing about it is, there's like, um, if you go on YouTube and look up cover versions of You Spin Me Round, it's like, there's like a million cover versions of that. And one of them was like by Jessica Simpson, who tried to make it into a country <sighs> style song. Oh. That just doesn't even sound right. Doesn't sit. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I, she did that remake of "Your Boots Are Made for Walking." That's just yeah, what yeah, they'll do. Very, that was I, okay. I don't know about you spin me. I don't know. I'm gonna have to uh, look Nancy this up. Nancy Sinatra. I like Nancy Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, did you know Nancy Sinatra was once in a movie? Hmm. No. I didn't. didn't she know. was in the movie with Boris Karloff called The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> the Invisible Bikini. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who, I wonder who wrote this, a man? <laughs> the, the, Nancy Sinatra was actually in a movie with Boris Karloff called The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just hilarious that either one of them is in that. I would have thought Boris Karloff would have been like, (laughs) looked at the script and he'd be like, no, thank you. Come on now. Come on now. I don't need money Mm -hmm. that badly. I got savings. (laughs) 
Same with Nancy Sinatra, <laughs> but you know, I guess the allure <laughs> of starring in a beach movie. This was like on the tail end of those um, beach blanket bingo movies that they were trying to do beach blanket bingo movies that yeah. um, okay. that they tried to integrate with horror movies to hit, hit the drive-in crowd. And that one didn't do very well. It was kind of like the last gasp of the, the old beach mm. movies. If you could turn back time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you tell him? Yeah, but I would advise against certain bad relationships in the past. Oh, I hear you on that. <laughs> and if heaven exists what would you like to hear god say when you arrive at the pearly gates i would want him to say he have holding a copy of human doll and say i just can't put this book down <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> good job or Mark the hell next door yeah. the hell next door he'd be reading this and saying you got it all right. This is, this is, this is it. Yeah. You you really nailed it, didn't? He he'd shake my hand. I yeah. nailed it. He'd be like, he'd give the book a tender kiss, and and that and he'd <laughs> say that I provided him with some entertainment because he's gonna live forever, so he needs some entertainment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is uh, that is awesome. That that's great. Yeah. So where can people find you if they want to know more about you? If they want to get my books, they can get them on Amazon. They're all over, all over Amazon. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for for being on the podcast. Well, you're welcome. It was a lot of fun. Now I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna be waiting for you to write that book about yeah. your 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 mother's torrential affair with Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> oh, that would get me in so much trouble. <laughs> If you're hearing this message, you've listened to our new episode all the way through. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You can find Mark's contact information in the show notes at the holisticlifecoachpodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review at Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram at the Holistic Life Coach Podcast and at the Holistic Life Coach Podcast page on Facebook. Thanks again. Until next time, beautiful souls.